Now let's talk about gas laws, and these gas laws will lead us to something called the combined gas law. The first of these is Boyle's law, and what we can imagine is a simple experiment where we have a gas trapped between liquid mercury and a rubber stop stopper in a glass tube, and that what we then do is we add more liquid mercury to the tube. What we've already discussed <clears throat> is that uh, the height of liquid mercury uh, equals a pressure, so, and in fact, millimeters of mercury is a pressure, so higher pressure. And that higher pressure, if we did this experiment, would lead to a smaller volume. And uh, just to be specific, that is a smaller volume of gas. This doesn't work with liquids or solids. So uh, higher pressure, smaller volume of gas. Uh, we could do an experiment with several different amounts of pressure and then measure the volume in the container and we would find a relationship that looks like this. And what we would then do is we would then find inverse volume, which is one over volume and versus pressure, and we would find that there is a linear relationship. So uh, what we're finding is that uh, pressure is proportional to one over volume. Okay. And so this is also called uh, that pressure is inversely proportional to volume or pressure is proportional to the inverse of volume. And of course, another way to refer to the inverse would be the reciprocal. Both of those are ways of saying one over volume. Now, uh, what we can see is that this relationship uh, is linear. That's what proportional means. So for pr pressure is proportional to one over volume. And in fact, we can see that it goes to the origin and for relationships like this, what we can say is if they're directly proportional, then pressure is going to equal one over volume times a constant. And the constant we will call lowercase k, uh, and uh, that's a pretty common thing to do. Uh, constant in German starts with a k, not a c. So all this is is putting a number there. We won't say what this number is, we just know that uh, there is a constant that relates these two. That's what being proportional means. And what we can then do is we can then multiply through by volume on both sides to find that PV equals a constant. And if PV equals a constant, that means any set of values should just be P1, V1. Any set of P and V will equal a constant. So P2, V2 could be some other pressure and volume equals P3, V3, etc. And now we have just taken this relationship here and turned it into the more commonly used form of Boyle's Law. And this is a general relationship, meaning that any time you see two things multiplied times each other that gets to a constant, you get a relationship just like this. We've seen something like this before, specifically for the dilution formula. And the dilution formula, and I'll put it in parentheses because we're just mentioning it here. We did already uh, memorize this and see that a version of this is on the conversion and equation sheets. Uh, so. Um, but this in here, molarity and volume are inversely proportional to you. As one goes up, the other goes down. Pressure and volume follows the same relationship. Okay. Now, what does this mean on a molecular scale? Well, we'll talk a little bit about this, uh, and we've talked about it already. 
So we know that pressure is caused by the molecules striking the sides of the container. Okay, and so we've got, uh, in a very real way, we've got pressure being created by gas molecules hitting the surface, uh, any surface, but uh, my uh, demonstration here is this is a gas particle striking the surface, creating uh, with a force and creating a pressure. And then what we're going to do is we're going to move from a one kilogram weight to a two kilogram weight. That's gonna double the force, double the mass, double the force, and when you double that force, uh, it's gonna sink at first until the volume decreases enough, so volume decreases, until uh, the collisions that were bumping into all these areas, so there's less area, so there's, uh, there is less area, but the same number of collisions And so now there's more collisions pushing on the smaller volume and the smaller surface area. And so uh, what happens is there are more collisions pushing back against the, the uh, two kilograms because there is less volume. So volume decreases until there is less area, but the same number of collisions. So more collisions per area equals higher pressure. So that's a colon, more collisions per area equals more pressure. And we're not gonna attempt to motivate exactly why there's a linear relationship or, a, or an inversely proportional relationship between the two. All we're trying to motivate here is that as you shrink this down in volume, with more pressure and more uh, mass, that there are more collisions in, uh, or the same number of collisions over a smaller uh, container size ends up having more collisions and more pressure to push against the two kilogram mass. Here is an example. Uh, a cylinder with a movable piston has a volume of 7.25 liters at 4.52 atmospheres. What is the volume at 1.21 atmospheres. We know that this is not an ideal gas law problem because there's no mention of moles or grams. So in searching around, we see that there's pressures and volumes. So we'll use P1 V1 equals P2 V2, which is also on your conversion equation sheet. A cylinder has a movable piston, a cylinder with a movable piston has a volume of 7.25 liters at 4.52 atmospheres. What is the volume at 1.21 atmospheres? Plug everything in, chug to the answer. V2 is going to be these two multiplied 4.52 times 7.25 divided by 1.21, 27.1 liters. All numbers have units in this class, or almost all numbers. Uh, here is a companion problem, although that also uses the same P1 V1 equals P2 V2. And now let's go on to a Charles Law experiment, and Charles Law. Again, you don't have to know the name. The experiment looks like this. We have a beaker of water, and in it, we have both a thermometer and a capillary tube. The capillary tube is sealed at the end, and it is sealed right here by a liquid bubble. So our gas bubble is actually that area right there. And what you can do is you can heat up the water, and as you heat up the water, 
the gas heats up and the gas bubble expands. And it's a simple experiment, although it's a very boring experiment to do because all you do is you heat up the water, the gas bubble expands, and then you turn off the flame and you let the water cool down over a couple of hours. Um, it does lead to very nice data. Um, and I'll show some of that data right now. This is actual data from doing this experiment um, back when we did an experiment in this course uh, using um, that apparatus shown on the last page. This is student data. And what this does is uh, the data was taken for height of the gas bubble versus temperature in degrees Celsius. And, uh, oh, we're a little zoomed in now, so let me get back out. There we go. And uh, for height of the gas bubble, instead of volume, we know that uh, for a cylinder, which is what our gas bubble is, the volume is going to be, let's see, um, pi r squared is going to be the area of this times height, where pi r squared now becomes our constant of proportionality and the volume of the cylinder of gas is now proportional to the height. So height of gas bubble is proportional to volume of gas bubble. Sorry, proportional to. Proportional to volume of gas bubble. And what we can also see is that the height of the gas bubble has a linear relationship with temperature. And therefore, height of the gas bubble is proportional to temperature. Put those two together and you get volume is proportional to temperature. Uh, and uh, what we'll do is we'll go ahead, so and if two things are proportional to each other, there is a constant of proportionality. That constant of proportionality means that volume over temperature for any of these combinations is proportional to uh, K. And we therefore get V1, excuse me, V1 over T1 equals K equals V2 over T2, et cetera, et cetera. And our version of Charles' law that is most useful is that V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. And this is what a relationship looks like for any two things that are proportional to each other. So mathematically, you can derive this for any of those relationships. And I should say, this is only true when T is in Kelvin, and we're still in degrees Celsius yet. So I'm going to add T in Kelvin right here. Let's see if I've got space. T in K, T in Kelvin, that is not Tink, as in Tinkerbell, one of my daughter's favorite characters. Uh, when she was younger. Okay, so same set of data. Now I'm going to expand the axes a bit. And when I do, I'm going to have the x-axis go all the way back to minus 300. And what we can do is, if you extrapolate the data all the way back here, and let's see, I'm going to make it work here. something like that, what you should find is that an extrapolation leads to the height of the gas bubble equaling zero. If it's done perfectly correctly, 
Uh, and that's hard because we are extrapolating. We are going well beyond where our data is. So any small errors lead to big errors when you get farther away from your data. But in a perfect world, the height of the gas bubble equals zero at minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. And this is one other thing that we can think about when we think of zero Kelvin because minus 273.15 equals zero Kelvin. Zero Kelvin is the temperature at which the height of a gas bubble and the volume of a gas bubble goes to zero. So zero Kelvin is the temperature at which a gas has zero volume. And that is true for an ideal gas. It is uh, also true that as you get to lower and lower temperatures, that the most that all gases uh, condense into a liquid, and then almost all of them go into the solid phase. That's one of the many reasons we have to extrapolate so far from our data here. We know something else about zero Kelvin, or I don't, uh, and we've certainly discussed it. I don't know, if, and I know we haven't proven it yet. Not only is it the temperature at which a gas has zero volume is the temperature at which uh, kinetic energy equals zero. And when kinetic energy equals zero, that means all motion, even vibrations. So all motion has stopped. So I'm gonna turn that into a comma. All motion has stopped. So no vibrations either. And we can't get to zero Kelvin, but as a limit, uh, and this is what we're suing here, is as a limit or an extrapolation, we can. Excellent. Now for uh, Charles Law, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Here's a typical example. Excuse me. Um, a gas has a volume of 2.57 liters at zero degrees Celsius, which is uh, 273.15 Kelvin. You must always work these problems in Kelvin. What was the temperature at 2.80 liters of volume? T2 is the unknown. Go ahead and cross multiply, solve for T2. Let's see, since they're proportional, we know that we have a larger volume. We must have a larger temperature, so it will be higher than 273. Let's see, cross multiply to 2.8 times 273.15, and 273 would be fine here as well. Divided by 2.57, 298 Kelvin. is the answer for this problem. Here is a companion problem. 